time again to relieve you from the Caribbean beach partying and snorkel diving. It's time to pay a tribute to my forefathers. I'm here to fight myself over a cold, wintry, wild North Sea. To embrace chaos. And to raise my glass to the Vikings at the Uphelia Viking Festival. To Shetland, this way. And to show my respect for the people who let us live the life as we know it today. Don't come easy. And between me and my price, it's 200 nautical miles of battlefield. I'm here to fight. And I'm here to claim what's mine. So come on and let me show you what's behind the doors of a real Viking celebration. On what started out as a calm morning, I was again all set for another adventure. Getting my sunstone and sunboard ready, or my navigation electronics, Tessie was again hungry to set her course away from a salty coastline. With Shetland set as our prize, Together we were up to a real challenge, crossing the mighty North Sea in strong headwinds all the way over. Until the cliffs of Shetland would appear in the end of the ocean. A slight taste of fear always occur in my mind as I get dressed just before departure. What has started out as a plan many weeks ago suddenly gets very real as I enter the point of no return. But once I get running, it slowly disappears and you get very focused on the adventure lying ahead. The latest weather reports would serve me 20 knots south-southwest onto my port beam as I left the coast of Haugesund. Later, Saturday evening, it would increase to refreshing 30 knots, still from south-southwest. But in reality, I was in for a little treat. Look at this. Oh, that's so nice. That's really nice. When getting close to Shetland, Sunday evening around 20 hundred, the wind would turn almost west-southwest, giving me 20 knots of headwind the last miles to port. I knew pretty well what I was about to encounter. So preparing my body and mind for what was about to hit me is as always a big part of this game. So the trick is to be determined. There's only plan A, no plan B. To have a plan B is setting up for failure, to have doubts. There is no other way around it than hoisting your sails, adjust the lights, set your course and go.
again. Another Opelia of Aki Festival. And things are looking very good. There's some slight rain. 20-25 knots. A couple of reefs in the mainsail and some rollins uh, on the general again. And uh, we are plunging in seven, uh, six, seven knots now. Again, oh, against the waves. And yeah, it all looks really good now. So I'm just, just going to alter my course now after I've uh, left uh, the rock, rocks of Gröwach. And then I'm going to point my bow straight to, to Shetland. And my goal, my goal of Shetland. Oh, look at my flag. Whoops, here to save it. Kyst Radio Sør, det var seilbåten Tessi, Tessi, kallesignal Lima Echo 3729. Every time I cross the North Sea, I always inform the Norwegian Rescue Center of my departure. They want to know who I am, phone number, who is my next of kin, my destination, and when I expect to arrive. And last but not least, what actions to be done if I'm not to be reached after my stated arrival. Getting seasick here. <laughs> I reported my estimated time of arrival on Shetland to be around 20 hundred Sunday evening. After 34 hours of sailing. Yes. Heavy waves. Oh, we go. That's the wind now, so it's uh, it's inc uh, increased a little bit the last hours. The time is now uh, uh, soon at three o'clock, and uh, the dark will come upon me uh, in uh, one two hours. Uh, yeah, we're doing good. Twenty miles offshore, and uh, you're running by autopilot here, the new autopilot. I just want to run it to, to see that it can cope with the with the with the winds and the waves and the movement and the pressure of the boat. It's look, it looks pretty good. Deciding whether to reef or not when the wind picks up is always a little pain. Reefing the mainsail on my boat 
means a lot of work around the mast. And in heavy seas, this is a dangerous place to be. So sometimes postponing is tempting, gambling that the remaining sail area will overlive the expected wind increasement. Keeping the boat going efficiently as we proceeded further out of shore takes a lot of effort and energy. Look at that beast. To keep the energy at a top level also takes a lot of food. Spaghetti alla capri. Very long time no see. So with everything going quite so well, there is always an issue disturbing the peace. So is that the water in the boat problem again? Uh, down here, oh, we're lying pretty good to starboard side now, so all the water in the bilge is coming out to the side. And I just have to uh, get rid of it every now and then it's not it's not very pleasant but you know it's just the way the boat is built uh. to be honest the main reason for all the water coming inside has nothing to do with the design of the boat but a very bad shortcut made by the skipper himself way forward in the anchor locker Seawater runs in where the anchor chains comes through the deck. To drain this out, it's normal to have a couple of draining holes through the hull. But my anchor locker is deeper than the water line. So to get the water out, I have made a drainage hose. Running from the locker and down to the bilge. With the thought of getting rid of it using the bilge pump. But when the boat is heeled over, the water runs away from the pump making it impossible to reach. So the water level is slowly rising for every wave finding its way through the anchor chain hole. It's just flat and uh, all the water is coming, sliding into the side here now. So, yeah, nice, nice and moist. And also, what is a very common problem with Mass coming through the deck uh, is water coming in, so you can see the drops here falling down, and everything here is wet now. So, this is my bunk now on starboard side when I sleep. Like now, we're gonna have a little rest and uh, yeah, just uh, head on. Everything's good. Having a short 20 minute nap is necessary to get some charging. But not to get too lazy, it's also important to have some fun. So a quick ride on the foredeck is always a good way to stay awake and focused. And also completely soaked. Comfortable. Yeah. Take my clothes off and have them dry out a little bit. Oh, I'm soaked. There's a boat coming here. Huge uh, tanker coming here this way. It's gonna pass aft of me. Oh wow. 
I'll be damned. The bloody camera fell down again. And I broke the protection uh, glass uh, on the lens. Oh, shit. That's <laughs> Even if I had it properly secure up here with this one it was not good enough. Oh. Sixty percent left. Uh, I think it's time to use the uh, this uh, what and see hydro generator. So I'm just gonna switch on some deck light here, and voila, daylight on deck. Uh, and uh, it's gonna be a kind of a difficult situation to get that what and see. Uh, waterborne uh, and this waves I can do. from the bow. It's amazing. But it's not the safest place to be so I'm gonna, gonna head, head back now. A fucking lot easier. Mm. It's that time of year again. Oh. Mm. Shit. Oh. All right. <laughs> oh. Everything is so much easier when the bullets is tilted. Okay. 
Sailing is hard. Getting it on video is harder. But going to the toilet, the worst. Ooh, it's a pissy. We're healing 30 degrees to starboard. And uh, water is just filling up through the anchor uh, anchor uh, engine on the bow. And it's gotten all on the side to the inverter and to the charger. And it just fills up the room with the, where the heater is. It's terrible, there's no way to get rid of it. Uh, I think I need to disconnect some wires here. Fucking hell. Look at this. Oh, that's so nice. Okay, so I got to put, put her on top of a, of a box here. So it's just, just loose. I just have to watch it. There's nothing else to do than just take the water out with a cup. This is the first time I think the bow is going under on every wave due to the headwinds and head waves against the bow. So I think the water wind, the, the anchor winds is soaked. Got this little oh, this little new device. It's called it's, oh, it's called the Garmin in Reach. Really cool little thing. With this one, I uh, uh, update my position on uh, Facebook and, uh, <coughs> every hour, so people can uh, go in and track where I am. And I also every six hours, I uh, I uh, give them a message just to tell tell them how things are, waves, the sea state, and the wind and. Yeah, so I just put it out here to have the coverage and it's amazing, it sends the message up to the satellites and, uh, and uh, yeah, the satellites pass, pass it on to you, so it's really nice, hope it works, I have no clue if it works out there but I think it does, <laughs> choppy waves in the dark. Let's go out and see how it is. So we are halfway now. Over halfway. And the waves are big. And we are just being slammed into the side. Oh. Oh. A little too much sail up, and, uh, uh, but we're doing seven, eight knots with 60. Uh, the wind 60 degrees off our bow. That's good, but uh, we are healing very much, and, uh, and it's pretty uncomfortable on board because uh, everything it slams into the starboard side and getting pushed in. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's tiring to to stay on board and walk around. Just on the edge of if I got to reef the main sail. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Or not, but uh, I think we're good for now. It's 25 knots of wind now. But we're getting there. We are getting there. While passing the last oil platform, meaning I'm 100 nautical miles away from the nearest shore in both directions, getting washed around in these mighty seas in pitch black dark. It's remarkable to know that the only thing keeping me alive out here is my tiny little boat fighting every wave against our prize. After a long night, I was ready for the daylight to occur.
on the on the head sail. So we have 50 nautical miles to go now before we uh, reach Shetland. So uh, yeah, let's take down that main sail. The last couple of hours the wind had picked up, touching gale force. It's fascinating to see how quickly the waves increasing violently and how easy they toss my boat around. Instead of fearing the conditions, I much rather change my mindset to embrace the hell and chaos evolving ahead of my boat. It's there to make you stronger and I see it as a rare gift given for us to have the opportunity to put up a real fight. To recover my mainsail, I am forced to climb forward along deck to the mast. That's where the halyard is to be released in order to pull the sail down by hand. In 30 knots of headwinds, crashing into 4 to 6 meter waves, this is the most risky job to be done on my boat. So the main focus is two things, hold fast and stay on board. Big job and uh, <clears throat> kind of scary on the foredeck on those waves, but uh, the shit is done now. The mainsail is down, so I'm feeling a lot safer. Uh, we lost a couple of knots actually, but I'm gonna haul out some more headsail and uh, get going. So we're getting there, we're getting there. and uh, waves have picked up insanely now the last hour or two. We are 30 miles from Shetland now. And I think the, the currents, I think maybe the ocean currents are uh, playing with us and giving us huge waves. It's hitting us really hard. from my target up here somewhere. Get rid of the water pouring inside my boat. I was slowly closing into the islands until I finally could see the cliffs rising up in the horizon. Battered but not beaten, I had again made it over the North Sea battlefield. Uh, just couldn't take it anymore. Shetland is uh, 
two hours sailing away. You can barely see it in the horizon. But it's getting dark now, so... But it's there, and I, uh, I think I'm leaving it so far. Uh, you can call it a wet and windy experience. So I'm just gonna go inside my engine and make sail now to balance the boat out. And, uh, yeah, as, as more uh, close to shore I get, the waves will come down. Because it's not, it was, it's just too little wind and too much uh, waves to, to, uh, to keep a good speed on the boat. So uh, just help me with that. Alright, see you inside. ocean waves find their way towards Lervik Shetland, they will encounter some cliffs called the Nab, protecting the entrance of the city. Further up on the top of these hills, you will find the location of the Shetland Coast Guard Operation Room, which has kept a sharp watch of the surrounding waters since the 1920s. Today consisting of 20 full-time officers and 113 volunteers. Through their radio station, they are monitoring if any emergency call should come in. A search and rescue operation will immediately be initiated, calling out the brave volunteers, making themselves ready to save lives either off the cliffs, mud or water. When closing in on these islands, it's a warm and welcoming feeling knowing there are brave souls watching over me if anything should occur in these fierce oceans. That's the Shannon Coast Guard bus. Understood, thank you. Uh, do you require us to uh, report back to, uh, back to Norway, Heather? Yeah, could you do that? Would be wonderful, thank you. That's the Shannon Coast Guard bus. No problem. Enjoy your stay and uh, speak to you later. Coast Guard out. nice people sitting there. I think it's a uh, cigarette time. Yes it is. So the last thing to be done was again taking down the mainsail but in much calmer conditions. Then slowly motoring inside between the navigation buoys into the safe beautiful harbor of Lurvik. That's me on Shetland. It's pretty quiet here. I'm gonna meet uh, Sigur and uh, the, my old friends on Shetland and I'm looking very much forward to it. So I guess I'm just gonna take my uh, fenders and uh, ropes and get ready and just uh, make fast and uh, let's start the celebration of the Vikings. Nice. Tuesday morning, it was all set for the big event. You can feel the city is a little different. Like there's more energy and excitement among people. The Uphelia festival celebrates the sun turning and has been going on since the 18th century. I left my boat to see the morning procession. This is when the Viking squad, led by the Geyser Jarl in front, marches all the way around the city, followed by all the younger hopeful Vikings, which also play a big role in the procession. Until they reach the harbor site. Here they take a little break before they move on to their next stopping points. It 
It's amazing to see how detailed their outfits are. No doubt this is taken seriously. But the main event happens when the dark sets in. The sky is lit when over 2,000 torches is being set on fire and carried by the locals making an almost endless parade of smoke, sparks and fire. The sight is overwhelming, to say the least. To the beats of mighty tones from bagpipes and drums, the parade starts moving and march their way around the streets of Lurik. until they gather around the galley inside a huge arena. After a speech, they all salute the Geyserial. Before throwing their torches into the galley, starting a ferocious fire, reaching way up in the sky. You can feel the heat beaming well into the crowds of spectators. The Uphelia is officially started. And so is the party. I started my celebration at the Legion Hall, where I got joined with hundreds of other peoples, which was both local and visitors. I was in the right place, and I was very grateful to experience this with all my closest and best friends on these islands. party takes its toll, and even a Viking have to take a short rest before it's ready for another battle again. Thank you so much for watching my little adventure, and I really hope you enjoyed it. I can assure you, my journey back to Haugesund was another very windy one. And more wind! Winds peaking over 40 knots to the side. But it is a good way to test your skills and your boat and to be confident in what you do. Remember, there is no plan B, only plan A. Claim your prize, take what is yours, and if it's not yours, you fight until it is. I consider this adventure a good warm-up for my upcoming journey to Greenland in July. And I hope you will join my ride. So check out my t-shirts and merchandise. Support me on Patreon. And check out my Facebook and Instagram for more news and updates. See you soon. Eric. <laughs>